So as an introduction, I'll briefly go over the epidemiology, pathogenesis, and histology of Merkel cell carcinoma. We'll talk about the clinical presentation of the disease, um, the new staging system. I'll talk about how, ma how we manage um, various stages of Merkel cell carcinoma. And then I'll wrap up with some clinical pearls um, for this disease. So Merkel cell carcinoma is a rare cutaneous neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, there are approximately 2,500 cases estimated to be diagnosed in the United States in 2018. Um, this compares to over 5 million cases of non-melanoma skin cancer, and if you include melanoma in situ, approximately 180,000 cases of melanoma. Um, so this disease is rare, so really why do we care about this disease? Um, we care because Merkel cell carcinoma has a high risk of regional nodal metastasis as well as distant metastasis. In addition, the incidence of Merkel cell carcinoma is increasing. So um, just recently, Kelly Paulson and um, Paul Neum at the University of Washington um, looked at the incidence of Merkel cell carcinoma, and we do see that the incidence is increasing. And so um, if you look at 2020, it's projected to be about 2,800 cases diagnosed in the United States and 3,200 cases um, diagnosed in 2025, so the incidence is increasing. You know, which patients are at risk for this disease? We see typically older patients. Um, when we see patients in our cohort, they're typically over the age of 60. We do have um, a small handful of younger patients in their 30s, um, but most patients are over the age of 60, uh, most commonly on sun-exposed areas, and again, immunosuppressed patients are at a higher risk of this cancer as well. So, you know, what causes this cancer? In 2008, the Merkel cell polyoma virus was identified um, by Pat Moore's group at, the, um, at Pittsburgh. Here you can see just a cartoon of the genetic makeup of this um, virus, and you can see that it expresses the small and large T antigen. Um, for many years, it was really thought, does this virus cause the cancer, or is it a passenger um, and just detected in the cancer? And so very recently, in 2017, Anj Delugos and Monique Verhagen at the University of Michigan developed a mouse model um, where they're able to express the small T antigen within the mouse epidermis. And when they combine that with an additional factor, ATO1, they're able to, um, to generate Merkel cell carcinoma-like tumors in the mouse skin. So here you can see um, normal skin where these, um, the small T antigen and the additional factor is not expressed. However, when you combine the expression of these two um, these two genes, you can um, demonstrate or generate a Merkel cell carcinoma-like tumor. So the brown staining here is cytokeratin 20, um, which stains the vast majority of Merkel cell carcinomas. So if the patients are not virus positive, then, you know, what are the other causes of this cancer? Um, and in 2015, Paul Harms and Arul Chenayan at the University of Michigan took uh, many primary Merkel cell carcinomas and did um, sequencing of these um, tumors. And really what they found um, was quite interesting. And you can see, as highlighted, the virus-negative tumors um, had a much um, higher uh, burden of mutations. And so when you delve into that a little bit more and you look at the type of mutations that are found um, within these tumors, these tumors actually, these mutations actually had the UV DNA damage signature. And so right now we have this idea that there are really two pathways by which this cancer um, is formed or developed. You have your polyomavirus pathway and then you have your DNA damage pathway. Um, to generate these tumors. So what does this tumor look like on histology? This is a small, round, blue cell tumor, neuroendocrine tumor. Um, the differential diagnosis, um, the first most important one is do they have a metastasis on their skin from a small cell lung cancer? Um, lymphomas in the differential diagnosis as well as small cell melanoma. Because of this, immunohistochemical stains are always performed to confirm the diagnosis. Um, typically, you'll see a neuroendocrine marker um, being expressed, um, cytokeratin 20 and a paranuclear dot pattern, and they'll be negative for thyroid transcription factor 1. So here you can see immune histochemistry for um, cytokeratin 20. You see your nice nucleus here, and you can see your um, brown cytokeratin 20 paranuclear dot. Um, if you have uh, metastatic small cell lung cancer on the skin, the, the immune histochemical stating will be different. It will be negative for um, cytokeratin 20 and positive for TTF1. So what do these um, cancers look like um, on patients? Typically, patients typically begin 
with a small primary tumor. It's usually a pink to purple little bump. Um, you can see here, this is a biopsy scar of a very, very small um, Merkel cell carcinoma. And because this tumor begins and doesn't look like much of anything at all, it often leads to a delay in the patients to actually present to their um, doctor, and then an additional delay in the diagnosis. Um, so very commonly we hear a story that the patient um, had a very small spot on their skin, and over the course of two to three months, this actually grows quite rapidly. And so here you can see a picture of a patient who had had this tumor growing for a couple of months. You can see it's much more, it's much more significant. Um, we often, the, the, because these tumors actually also don't have a characteristic look to them, um, they're often initially diagnosed as a cyst or inflamed follicle, often treated with IV antibiotics or, or oral antibiotics and incision and drainage. Once these tumors do not respond to that treatment, a biopsy is performed um, and the diagnosis of Merkel cell carcinoma um, is rendered. And so here what I would like to do is just show you a few pictures of the primary Merkel cell carcinoma tumors. And then once you see it, um, several of these pictures, you'll get a sense for what these tumors look like. And after a while, they sort of all start to really look, look the same. So here you can see um, primary tumor um, on a lower eyelid here. Here's a larger primary tumor on a patient's elbow. Here's a tumor on the ankle. Um, and on the, on the shin. And so these tumors all, they look more dermally based in some ways. There's usually these epidermal changes are here are essentially from the biopsy scars. Um, and they are all sort of this sort of juicy, erythematous, violaceous, um, papula, papula nodule that we see. So now I just want to briefly uh, mention that the staging system for this cancer has been revised in 2018 um, with the eighth edition of the AJCC staging system. So in 2016, um, we looked, um, utilized the um, National Cancer Database and analyzed about 9,000, over 9,000 patients with this disease to see if we could identify any modifications to the seventh edition staging system. And so just to very um, quickly run through that, um, now, one of the changes are is there's a pathological stage and a clinical stage for Merkel cell carcinoma similar to um, what you see in, in melanoma. Um, and so stage zero is in situ uh, Merkel cell carcinoma. And so these, these patients do exist. We have a small handful of patients who have an in situ Merkel cell carcinoma where the disease is completely confined to the epidermis. These patients actually do very well. Um, stage one disease is when the primary tumor is um, smaller than or equal to two centimeters in size and the nodes have been deemed pathologically negative. And so here's just an example of a very small primary um, Merkel cell carcinoma on the ALA. It's actually just a biopsy scar, so a very small um, stage one disease here. Um, stage two disease is essentially when the tumor, the clinical tumor diameter is over two centimeters in size, or stage two B disease when the tumor does invade into the muscle cartilage or bone. Um, these patients additionally have negative pathologic nodes, and so just an example of a stage two um, patient with Merkel cell carcinoma. Uh, moving on to stage three disease, um, this is um, nodal disease, and so one of the uh, changes for the staging system is that patients who present to your office with a nodal metastasis but no known primary skin lesion, um, those are called patients uh, metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma with unknown primary disease. Um, many, many studies have shown that these patients actually have an improved prognosis compared to patients who have a primary skin lesion and a nodal metastasis at the time of presentation. And so because of that improved prognosis, they've been downstaged from 3B now to 3A disease. And so now we have, um, now these patients again are, are regrouped in the 3A disease. And so here's a patient who had a submandibular um, met metastasis to the nodes, no known primary, and so she is um, stage 3A. She's doing very well. Um, again, um, stage 3A disease has been classically um, microscopic disease in the sentinel lymph node biopsy, and so that is still the case. Um, patients who have a occult metastasis in their node are stage 3A. Here you can see an example of a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which shows about 20 to 30 percent surface area involvement um, uh, um, highlighted by the CK20 staining here. So moving to stage um, 3B disease, um, this, this category um, is defined by patients who present to you with a primary skin lesion and a bulky node on exam um, or on exam or to, and then proven by histology. 
Um, here you can see a PET scan showing a bulky axillary metastasis. Um, one of the changes that have been implemented in the new staging system is to sort of further classify stage 3B disease. Um, and so the subcategories of N2 disease are in transit disease without lymph node metastases. So here you can see a patient who has uh, multiple in transit METs. And now we have a category N3 disease, um, which combines um, the in transit metastasis with um, nodal disease as well. Um, stage four disease is um, still distant metastases. You can see a patient who has a lung met. So now um, what I want to do is just move on to sort of how we approach or manage um, patients with Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, and so here's just um, a snapshot of the NCCN guidelines. And so um, because Merkel cell carcinoma is very rare, we don't have randomized, um, you know, double-blinded controls comparing how to treat um, this cancer. And so it can be very challenging. And so. Um, once there's a diagnosis of Merkel cell carcinoma, again, multidisciplinary um, consultation and consideration is very important. Um, we do have a multidisciplinary tumor board at the University of Michigan where we really discuss um, all of our patients and any new developments with, with that happens with that patient to make sure that everyone has a consensus recommendation on how to um, proceed. And we really try to micromanage our patients and try to minimize the morbidity of treatment but maximize the effect of that treatment as well. And so. Um, many, many specialties are represented at the tumor board, and so um, we have a good, um, you know, working relationship with, with everyone and are able to really take, um, take good care of our patients. So let's first think about, you know, how we um, approach the primary site. Um, and per the NCCN guidelines, um, treatment of the primary site is really surgically with wide local excision. And we typically think about using a one to two centimeter margins, but um, you probably would not consider taking a two centimeter margin um, with this patient here. And so it's very important that surgical margins um, should be balanced with the morbidity of surgery. And we should also think about um, doing this surgery that will not delay any adjuvant radiation if, if that is um, deemed necessary for the patient as well. Um, important thing to think about when you're thinking about surgery um, is to really cons um, really use um, staging of the nodal basin with sentinel lymph node biopsy concurrently with um, uh, the primary surgical management of the primary lesion. So let's think about management of the primary site and which patients need adjuvant radiation, which patients don't. Do they all need adjuvant radiation? Um, and so per the NCCN guidelines, you can consider observation, meaning no adjuvant radiation um, of very small primary tumors when the primary tumors are widely excised or when there are not um, additional adverse risk factors. And so we recently looked into um, our cohort of patients, and we do have a cohort of patients, 105 patients who had a very small primary primary tumor, something, something similar to this, or, you know, under two centimeters in size. Um, and these patients were treated with excision only without adjuvant radiation. And this is thinking about the primary site only. And thinking that the purpose of adjuvant radiation is to prevent a local recurrence here. And so the question was is, you know, what are the recurrence patterns in these patients who did not have radiation to the primary site? Um, do they recur locally within transit METs? Do they recur regionally or distantly? And if you look at this um, cohort of patients, there was only one patient who had a true local um, and satellite recurrence. And so this, this is the only one patient who might have benefited from um, adjuvant radiation here. There were a total of 19 recurrences in this cohort of patients. Um, the, the recurrence patterns were in transit disease that would not have been um, prevented by adjuvant radiation, um, nodal disease, or distant disease. So observation may be considered in the right patient um, patient population. Um, we often do um, consider the use of adjuvant radiation um, when these tumors are larger, if they're two centimeters in size or larger, um, despite clear surgical margins. If the mar surgical margins are positive and additional surgery cannot be performed, or if there are other adverse features such as angiolymphatic invasion, we would certainly consider um, the use of adjuvant radiation after surgery in this um, population of patients. So let's talk a little bit now about uh, management of the nodal basin. So the first thing that is important is a clini good clinical exam. And so when the patient comes into your office with a Merkel cell carcinoma, you evaluate the nodal basin very carefully. And if you don't find any palpable um, regional um, nodes that are concerning for metastasis, then our treatment plan is to um, excise the primary tumor and stage the nodal basin with a sentinel lymph node biopsy. 
Um, in 2011, um, Dr. Schwartz um, looked at, again, our cohort of patients um, to look for features that might predict a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy. And melanoma, were very comfortable not performing sentinel lymph node biopsy on, thin, on patients with thin melanoma. And the idea was, is there a group of patients with Merkel cell carcinoma that also might um, be able to avoid um, this staging procedure? Um, we looked at um, 97 primary tumors in that subgroup, 93 sentinel lymph nodes were identified. Um, things that were analyzed were tumor size, you know, five millimeters, um, one, cent um, f one centimeter, one, you know, as the size goes up, um, tumor depth, Breslow thickness, tumor histology, circumscribed versus infiltrative growth pattern, mitotic rate, and really they found that regardless of the different subgroups that they stratified, even the smallest tumor, um, the lowest mitotic rate, circumscribed growth pattern, all of these um, parameters had at least a 15 to 20 percent risk of a nodal metastasis. And so the recommendation from this paper was really to consider consider sentinel lymph node biopsy in all patients who present to you without clinical nodal disease on exam. Um, subsequently, several papers have also um, identified that there is a very high risk of nodal disease even in patients with very small primary tumors. And so what do you do to manage that um, sentinel lymph node biopsy? So this is um, per the NCC guidelines. Um, again, consider multidisciplinary tumor board management, um, baseline imaging to determine now they have stage three disease, um, could they possibly have stage four disease, so baseline imaging. Clinical trial is always um, a good option. And then the important thing is that nodal basin really needs to be treated. Um, different centers will treat the nodal basin differently based upon where you are. Different Australia uses more radiation. Um, we have typically, historically, been more surgically inclined, although with with the advent of new checkpoint inhibitors, um, things are changing. Um, and the important thing is that nodal basin really needs to be managed. Um, we, we will consider surgery with a node dissection, either with or without um, adjuvant radiation, depending upon the burden of disease determined by that nodal dissection. Um, or um, oftentimes, if there's a very small amount of disease in the lymph node, and some centers will use radiation only. But the important point is the nodal basin needs to be treated. So what do you do with patients who have a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy? Can you trust that result? Um, Merkel cell carcinoma tends to spread, and it makes um, doctors and patients sometimes very uncomfortable to have a negative result and not do anything. Um, and so really the recommendation is, is you can really trust that sentinel lymph node biopsy result, and we wouldn't want to necessarily um, over-treat or increase the morbidity of treatment if it's not necessary. And so in 2015 um, at Mayo, um, Travis Grotz and his colleagues looked at sentinel lymph node negative um, Merkel cell carcinoma, and they looked at same nodal basin recurrences. And what they found is they had um, 111 patients, and really, you know, only nine patients or 8% of those patients recurred in the same nodal basin after a, a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy. And so the recommendation from this paper is to avoid, um, you know, nodal avoid additional treatment to that nodal basin after a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy and really just monitor patients for um, recurrence and treat if needed. Um, and so what do you do if you have a patient who comes to you with uh, a bulky node on exam um, and a primary tumor? You definitely want to obtain a histologic diagnosis. Um, if you have a positive result there, then you would um, further image um, to look for stage four disease. You think about um, tumor board consultation and then treatment of that nodal basin if there's no um, systemic disease. And moving on to, this is where things kind of have become really exciting for Merkel cell carcinoma, and things have really begun to change quite dramatically over the last year. So how do we manage stage four disease? You know, chemotherapy really was a standard of care for a long time. However, it was, did not um, demonstrate or provide a durable response for our patients. Um, just recently in 2016, um, Dr. Iyer and Neum, they looked at, um, they reviewed, um, patients who had metastatic disease, and, and they found 62 patients, and they looked at the efficacy of, of chemotherapy, their first line or second line. And um, they essentially found that the median survival after the start of chemotherapy was only 9.5 months. Um, the median progression-free survival um, after first-line chemotherapy was only 94 days, and even shorter for second-line chemotherapy. So this is just demonstrating what we really already know, that chemotherapy, um, standard chemotherapy, is not um, durable for our patients with Merkel cell carcinoma. And so here you can see the progression-free survival curves. First-line chemotherapy was only 94 days, and second-line chemotherapy was only 61 days. 
Um, so what are the alternatives? And the alternatives are um, immunotherapy, um, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. And so this is where it has been really been become exciting um, for our Merkel cell carcinoma patients. So just almost a year ago, on March 23rd, 2017, Evalumab was approved for the treatment of metastatic um, Merkel cell carcinoma, and this was actually based upon the Javelin trial, and it was, it was actually second-line therapy after chemotherapy. And so um, the overall response rate to this, to Evalumab after chemotherapy was 33%. Um, the complete response rate was 11% with a 22% partial response rate. Um, this was given IV every two weeks. Um, and so prior to that being approved, um, Paul Neum and many, many, many others um, came together and looked at pembrolizumab for the treatment of Merkel cell carcinoma, metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma. This was first-line therapy. And so this was a phase two uh, multicenter trial. Um, first-line pembrolizumab every three weeks. Their primary endpoint was their objective response rate, which was 56%. It was a small study. Um, 25 patients were evaluated, but 26 patients were treated. But here you can see their pro progression-free survival curves um, in the median um, they had a nine-month progression-free survival. Again, there is a subgroup of patients that do have a complete response, um, and this is significantly improved compared to the two- to three-month um, progression-free survival for chemotherapy. So, you know, what's the next step? Clinical trials. There are clinical trials open for the management or treatment of metastatic um, Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, many of these are using immunotherapy, combinations of various immunotherapies, um, and then the next question is, is now that Evalumab is approved for metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma, you know, what can we think about, um, for, what is the role of adjuvant use of this drug or these similar types of drugs? And so there are also trials looking at um, the effect of adjuvant um, immunotherapy. Um, here's a, a trial that will soon be coming to the University of Michigan um, looking at stage 3B, treated Merkel cell carcinoma with Evalumab. It's a multi-center randomized um, trial for adjuvant Evalumab in stage 3B. Um, inclusion criteria, again, stage 3B, 3B disease, the nodal basin does have to be treated with surgery with or without um, radiation. Um, the dosing um, is induction and maintenance phase for two years. The primary outcome of this trial is relapse-free survival, and the secondary outcomes are MCC-specific survival, distant metastasis-free survival, of course, adverse events, and overall survival. So now I just want to move on to just a couple clinical pearls, things that we see in our clinic um, quite routinely and something to think about. Um, the, first, the first pearl is that these tumors grow quite rapidly over three months. There's nothing, and then, then you have a, a large tumor. And so um, this often, again, delete, leads to patients to delay to get into the doctor, um, but also a delay in the diagnosis because once they're in the office, it looks like a cyst or a, a furuncle. It's treated by antibiotics. And so something to consider. Um, ma many times, um, this size of this lesion does not grow over three months. It usually takes, if it's a basal cell, you know, years, uh, months to years to grow. And so um, sometimes... Um, it's important then to say, well, maybe maybe that patient is saying it's it's new. Maybe it is new, and if it's if it's if it's the right patient demographic, consider this diagnosis. Although again, this is a very very rare disease. Um, and then again, just to illustrate that um, you can have a positive central lymph node biopsy with these very small tumors, um, the data show that. But it's nice to illustrate that this is a small, very small biopsy scar from maybe a five millimeter Merkel cell carcinoma preauricular. Um, this is this patient's um, sentinel lymph node biopsy. So there's 30% surface area involvement. He actually had three positive sentinel lymph nodes. So two other nodes had single cell involvement, with the largest being um, within with this this node here. And so it is important, these tumors might look small, but they have a high risk of regional disease. The second pearl is, is you know, once you have a patient who's been treated, the disease is treated, they've, um, they're free of disease, um, the next step is really monitoring for recurrence. And so in our institution, um, if you look at times to recurrence, it's usually within that first year. So the first year is the highest. Um, we do have patients who recur after that. But what are you really looking for? You're looking for, you know, a local recurrence. You're looking for in-transit satellite disease, of course, and nodal disease. But sometimes the 
the beginning of the um, recurrences can be kind of subtle. Um, if they're seen at an outside um, facility or if they're seen, you know, in follow-up somewhere else, I've had patients who have been diagnosed with a spitting stitch when it's actually um, a local recurrence. And so um, something to think about, you, you want to have your eyes on your patients with Merkel cells so you can say, yes, it's a spitting stitch. No, it's actually a recurrence. And so this is a patient who had a primary Merkel cell carcinoma on their dorsal hand. They had a wide excision. They had a skin graft. Everything looks great there. I saw them in follow-up follow-up, and I, I said, you know, what's this little spot here? Oh, it's been there for a little while. I'm not sure. It was, it was barely palpable, but in this patient, um, I have a high degree of suspicion. So once it was biopsied, it was in transit metastasis. And so you want to be feeling there. You want to always kind of feel and examine very closely um, the extensors for the development of this. But it also can be um, more obvious. And so this is a patient who has had multiple in transit metastases. These um, here may be more subtle, but you know it's always more obvious when they're highlighted in purple. But um, these are more palpable and more violaceous. The other one last thing that I would like to share with you is that um, when when we think about Merkel cell carcinoma, everyone becomes very nervous. You read about all the overall survival statistics, um, and many of those statistics are based upon, you know, National Cancer Database data where Merkel cell specific survival is is um, not able to be identified, and so those um, sort of very poor numbers are based upon overall survival. And so if you look at any specific um, institution that takes care of patients with Merkel cell carcinoma, um, patients actually can do quite well with treatment. And so this is just an example. This is our um, the 104, 105 patients looking at primary surgery without, radi without radiation at the primary site. But those patients are all stratified into different stages of disease. And so their four-year survival for stage one disease was close to 95%, um, sentinel lymph node biopsy negative. For stage 3A disease, you know, 78% um, for your survival. And so our patients can, can, can do quite well with appropriate management. And this is also from our paper, but this is using um, National Cancer Database data, which is only overall survival. And you can see that um, the stark difference in the survival numbers between overall survival and stage one disease, 62% versus 94%, um, and 40% for 3A disease versus 78%. And so um, when, you're, when you're reading the literature and you're going through that, think about how um, the overall survival and the Merkel cell specific um, survival um, are going to be a little bit different, and that can help you and help the patients maybe feel a little bit, um, a little bit better. Um, and so just want to leave you with, um, you know, there are many different presentations of Merkel cell carcinoma, um, and multidisciplinary management is, is very important in the management of this disease. So um, thank you very much.